Watch it! Holy shit, that was amazing. I think I can safely speak for everyone when I say, this is gonna be one hell of a final battle now. Forget Clegane Bowl, I'm ready for Dragon Bowl. Brothers versus Dead Brothers. Ice versus Fire. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday! It's funny because the show airs on Sunday. So we'll talk about the craziness of a battle in a little bit. But of course we gotta get the other stuff out of the way, so let's get started. So we start beyond the wall, where Gendry's having a little trouble adapting to his new raid party. Tormund teases Gendry about his first time seeing snow and not being used to the cold. Meanwhile, the Brotherhood is trying to friendzone Gendry after they let him join their gang, and then they sold him into slavery. Gendry rightfully so gives them shit for what they did to him, until the Hound shuts him up and tells him his problems are extremely minute to what they're dealing with at this moment. I miss the Hound and his witty dickness. Tormund squads his way up to Jon and talks about his status as King in the North, and the whole debacle of him bending the knee to Daenerys reminds Tormund of Mance Raider and his pride. He warns Jon not to roll that way since they both know how that turned out. The way Tormund treats Jon after they were defeated at Castle Black makes me think Jon might as well be King Beyond the North or something. Jon and Jorah reminisce over Gior and his leadership while he was still alive. No surprise that Jon still knows nothing when he tries to give Longclaw to Jorah, the only weapon that he knows of that can defeat the White Walkers. And he tries to give it to a noble prince turned slave trader? Thankfully Jorah refuses and says Longclaw is now part of Jon's lineage now. In Winterfell, Sansa and Arya have more catching up to do. Arya reminisces about the first time that her father was proud of her. Turns out Arya was practicing archery long before that first glorious moment of her in the series pilot. Apparently Ned noticed her practicing and decided to give her a round of applause. Happiness meter drops way down when Arya brings up the note that she found in Littlefinger's room. Turns out it was the note that Sansa was forced to write by Cersei to summon her brother Rob back in season 1. They start arguing about how Arya thinks that Sansa betrayed her family. She scolds Sansa for her apparent treason. Sansa, however, scolds Arya for her absence while she was being trained by the Faceless Men. Hate to admit it, but I kinda knew this was coming. In a broad sense, everyone in the show has been thousands of miles apart from each other, and now that they're coming together, everyone's at each other's throats not knowing everything while the audience knows the full story. Arya storms off with that traditional I'm about to murder someone look, leaving Sansa with even more dread at her sister's apparent corruption. Back in the deepness of the North, Tormund and the Hound have a very humorous yet unsettling exchange about how the Hound got his face burnt off. Then Tormund unfortunately signs his own death warrant when he discusses his ambition to marry Brienne and start a family with her. This thought was a little funny considering Tormund's talking to someone who Brienne beat the crap out of. We get some very interesting insight when Beric talks to Jon about their purpose and why they're the ones who have cheated death. Beric seems to finally come clean about their purpose and the reason why they were brought back. Apparently it's for this exact moment where they're fighting for the living against death in its most tangible form. As if that weren't obvious enough. I know Beric is still an interesting, compelling character in the books. He serves a more straightforward purpose. And up to this point in the show, Beric has really been nothing more than a cardboard cutout of a magical warrior who no one really knows why he exists. However, this conversation between him and Jon gives him a lot more depth, and I admire the writers for that. Beric is humanized, he gives Jon a reason why he was brought back, and yet Jon still sees it as merely an excuse. Further up a ways, the Hound spots the Arrowhead Mountain he saw in his vision in the fire. Unfortunately, this isn't the mountain we were hoping he was going to throw down with, and the group makes their way towards it as we cut to Dragonstone. Tyrion and Daenerys discuss Danny's relationships and why she just can't seem to get laid anymore. Before the conversation abruptly shifts to Daenerys and Cersei's first meeting if it ever were to take place, Tyrion brings up the possibility of traps and reminds her how she should change her mindset from breaking this wheel of leadership to instead making her own wheel if the world were to prosper. If she becomes queen. He makes the grave mistake of telling Daenerys that executing Randall and Dickon, his son, was a bad idea. And I guess the whole wheel analogy is Tyrion's best argument, because he keeps bringing it up. Daenerys gets a little paranoid when Tyrion starts talking to her about her succession, and thinks Tyrion might have planned something when he met with his brother in King's Landing. Tyrion passionately denies it. Now at this point I started thinking, I really wish we still had season 2 Tyrion. Clean, witty, smart, and only drunk a third of his screen time. Only problem with that is that season 2 Tyrion might have actually started thinking about taking over if Danny were to perish. Here with Tyrion's new development, he knows his place, but it still makes him seem a little bit more cowardly. This could set up for a very tragic Tyrion death, but fortunately this conflict is extinguished very quickly. Last thing I want to think about is our favorite dwarf getting cooked alive by a dragon or even getting turned into a white. The Beyond the Wallers come across an ominous shape of a bear in the distance, and thus begins boss fight number one. Random soldier number seven gets axed, and then we get not just one, 
but two flaming swords from Beric and his trusty companion, Thoros. God, that slicing the sword motion to ignite it is so awesome. The zombie bear jumps Thoros, and it looks like the end for our favorite drunken fire priest. Since the Hound is able to help him, but can't due to his fear of fire, was really hoping this was the moment that he could finally face his fear. But it's up to Beric to hack the bear to bits and put it down with one good swing of his flaming sword. Beric pulls some magic on Thoros and cauterizes the wound, which is right on his stomach. A bite from a giant ass frozen zombie bear. And not one single intestine or pancreas sticking out. Back in Winterfell, Sansa and Littlefinger discuss how Arya could have possibly found that note. And Sansa's paranoia is increased tenfold considering she knows that her sister is not season one Arya anymore. This is when Littlefinger finally decides he's still playing the game by bringing up the idea of Brienne talking to both her and her sister. We cut back to Thoros and Jorah sharing a brotherly moment. Jorah compliments Thoros on his success as a proper priest at Pike during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Proper priest at Pike. Proper priest at Pike. Proper <laughs> Tormund spots a small group of dead people marching through the valley, and the group decides to track them when they spot that a White Walker is with them. Then comes boss fight number two when the group ambushes this patrol. Jon shows off more badass combat when he takes on the White Walker, and we get, yet again, another White Walker smashing into a million pieces with just one swing of Longclaw. This time, however, in classic Phantom Menace style, all of the Whites drop dead once the White Walker is killed. Except for some reason, one of them is still alive, and it looks like the raid group successfully captured their Pokemon. Sorry, I mean White. But before they're able to get the zombie restrained, what looks like the rest of the army of the dead shows up for the party. There's a very tense chase across a frozen lake. Random soldier number three lags behind, causing the lake to shatter all around them, safely cutting them off from the zombies who were chasing them, but now they're stuck on a rock on a giant piece of ice surrounded by the army of the dead. And I thought the setup for the battle at the Black Gate was intense. Some time passes and the Hound gets hysterically annoyed when the captured White starts making noise. Then something weird happened that I couldn't help but notice. When the Hound annoyingly kicks the White, the rest of the army around them makes painful noises. Kind of like they're a hive mind or something. Maybe this unstoppable force has a thermal exhaust port only two meters wide right below the main port after all. Unfortunately, turns out Thoros passed away in the night. Later on, as John and Beric stare at the army surrounding them, Beric officially announces his personal reason why he's still alive, which he claims is to kill the Night King himself. Ironically, Beric says this as the camera focuses on Jon. Coincidence? Sansa, for whatever reason, gets an invitation to King's Landing. Remembering her obvious hardships while she was a hostage, Sansa decides to send Brienne in her stead, which Brienne disagrees with wholeheartedly. Clearly worried that Littlefinger might have more diabolical plans if Sansa's guardian wasn't around. Sansa stands her ground and Brienne reluctantly leaves Winterfell. And just like that, since this was clearly Littlefinger's plan, Sansa becomes the red-headed puppet once again. More departures to be had when Daenerys gets Jon's call for help when Gendry arrives back at Eastwatch, and decides to fly up beyond the wall with all three of her dragons. <laughs> That's okay, it's not like she's gonna need them for later. Tyrion, rightfully so, tries to convince Daenerys to stay and that Jon's group is lost. Just goes to show that Tyrion may seem all good guy, but underneath, he knows who's expendable and who's valuable. More great shots of the dragons departing, leaving Tyrion a speck on the cliffside. Back at the rock, the whites start to get a little smarter, and they figure out that the ice isn't gonna break anymore. All thanks to the hound throwing a rock at him and it not smashing through the frozen surface. And just like that, Season 7 kicks off its epicness rivalry versus Battle of the Bastards, when Jon's group takes a last stand, fending off the dead as they charge up on the rock. The odds against our main characters suddenly drop to zero when the last red shirt dies, and now it's open season on the roster, starting with Tormund. For a solid four minutes, we see Tormund getting pinned down, dragged away, getting choked with a frozen blade, trying to fend off the dead that are trying to drag him away, tear into his insides, and slit his throat. Not gonna lie, with this moment, I and probably a lot of other people felt really uncomfortable just waiting for that moment that Tormund was guaranteed to be axed. He seems to be actually having a hard time. This is the first time that he actually seemed vulnerable to me. But not before the Hound finally has his crowning moment. By saving him with a few good swings of Robert's hammer, which he lifted from Gendry before Gendry retreated. Then as with any epic battle, things get real slow motiony and all seems lost. But then, ice and fire finally meet when Drogon shows up with Daenerys saddled into his back. Drogon gets play of the game when he cooks all of the zombies surrounding Jon's group. Once again, really great to see more dragon action this season. This is what I was really looking forward to. And then to finally see Viserion and Rhaegal get to have some fun. By the way, I apologize for thinking it wasn't Drogon that Danny was riding during the attack on Highgarden, nor whom allowed Jon to pet him during last episode. Dislike button is right down there, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, things don't go so well for Viserion, the cream-colored one, when the Night King is about to throw a spear at Drogon, but then takes a bet
sent from his second in command that he can't hit the flying one and hits Viserion dead center on his wing. Cue what might be the saddest death scene of this entire season when Viserion starts bleeding gallons and gallons of the red stuff before crashing into the lake and sinking into the icy water. Not gonna lie, I still would have felt something if a person died this episode, but I was really hoping it wasn't gonna be one of Danny's dragons. Then again, this is the penultimate episode of the season. Had to happen to somebody. John gets a little carried away with his fighting whilst everyone else retreats to climb up on Drogon's back. Daenerys watches in horror as the ice breaks beneath John's feet and he sinks into the depths himself. And then maybe a little too late, Daenerys finally heeds Tyrion's advice when she leaves the King in the North behind. Obviously a little too late considering one of her kids was just killed. After Danny leaves, the Lord of Light gives a great big middle finger to John dying. Apparently he doesn't want him freezing to death in negative 100 degree water when John climbs out of it. And just like the badass we remember when he was ready to take on Ramsay's army solo, he gets ready to slaughter a hundred thousand zombies who are charging right at him. Cue Ex Machina number two and Uncle Benjen shows up out of nowhere. Hey, first time John's seen his uncle since he disappeared in season one. And Benjen gives John his horse without barely saying a word and sacrifices himself by going down swinging. Literally. Well, we have had a lot of reunions this season, but I guess not all of them were gonna be heartwarming. Back at the wall, Daenerys is standing at the top, mourning the death of her dragon. Jon comes back, a tiny speck on a horse, charging straight towards the wall, and the Night's Watch lets their king back in. Davos helps with his recovery, and things finally start to quiet down. Let's all have a moment for our favorite cream-colored flying death machine. Sansa sneaks into Arya's quarters and eyeballs Littlefinger's dagger, before she finds Arya's bag which contains the faces she took from Bravos. Now I gotta admit, this scene threw me for a loop. I could swear the faces she pulled out looked like Littlefinger and Brienne, which I'm not gonna lie, would have marked for a great twist. Granted it would suck because it would mean that Arya killed the woman who was swore to protect her and her sister, but it would have been intriguing and got me thinking that Arya was playing her sister the whole episode by pretending to be both of them. Arya catches her and shows her true colors in full force. By mentioning the game of faces she used to play back in Bravos, really bringing home the conflict between sisters, especially when she threatens to take Sansa's own face. Now guys, just relax, more than likely she's lying to her, considering she says all this threatening stuff after she mentions the game of faces. Still though, can we all agree Sansa just can't seem to get a break this whole show? She nearly had a major dickhead king for a husband. She thought both her little brothers were dead for the longest time. Whilst she was in captivity under said major dickhead king, she's had her mind played with by a 50 year old man who thinks he's in love with her. She had her father executed right before her very eyes. Oh yeah, there's also the fact that she was raped. And now she's got her little sister playing psycho and threatening her life. Not liking where the relationship between these two is going. Elsewhere on the ship, John is in bed making his recovery with Daenerys at his side, where John finally swears allegiance to Daenerys. Also appealing to all the memers out there when he comments on his inability to bend the knee. John stares at her, clearly wanting some of that aunt and nephew Targaryen action. Daenerys almost seems to cave, but turns herself off at the last second. Maybe she wants a bear inside of her after all. Back beyond the wall, the Night King's minions pull a dead Viserion out of the water. And with one stroke of the Night King's hand, Viserion is resurrected as a zombie dragon before the credits roll. Now I know I could have talked more about everything that happened this episode. I can only really say the action was amazing. A lot of the scenes that didn't take place beyond the wall were masterpieces in their own form. But again, this episode was definitely more action than plot, which is not a criticism at all, there's nothing wrong with eye candy. There were still a lot of really good plot points. Looks like Sansa and Arya are about to butt heads, but instead of a whiny, girly, I spilled your nail polish bottle all over your Gucci bag way, it's a killy, throaty, I'm gonna kill my sister and wear her facey way. Oh yeah, there's also the fact that Viserion died and got turned against his own mother. And out of all the people I expected to die this episode, I did not think it was gonna be Thoros. A lot more twists and turns than I expected. Some really good fake outs too. There were a couple of moments that I thought that a main character in our raid group was killed off screen. For example, call me crazy, but I did spot a couple of whites that kinda looked like Beric and the Hound. And let's not forget Tormund's near death experience. Those cringy, gaggy, choking sounds that really brought it home that Tormund was guaranteed an icy grave. Even Benjen, whom I wonder where the hell he went after helping Bran out last season. It's like, there he is, and then all of a sudden, there he isn't. This is Game of Thrones, after all, expect the unexpected. With Viserion now an icy dragon, next week is gonna be lit as 
Fuck. For God's sake, it's the finale. Please give us at least one moment of zombie Viserion fucking shit up. There's no way the wall isn't gonna come tumbling down now, now that the Night King has a fucking dragon on his side. Seeing as this episode was 64 minutes long, I was expecting a lot of long, dragged out dialogue pieces. I expected more boring exposition with some cliche but thrilling twists. But I was proven wrong tenfold. The pacing was excellent, every frame was beautiful to look at, every element was put to good use, every character seemed to matter at some point in this episode. Every scene brought us closer and closer to the season finale and to the series end. And now I'm even more seriously worried about who's gonna be alive when this whole thing's over. And if somebody, if anybody, is gonna be seated on the Iron Throne at the end of it all. Out of all of our still living main characters, I'm worried for Arya the most. She's been quite the villainous little sister this season, for no reason at all. If there was a reason, it's that she's completely misunderstanding her sister's mentality. Almost in a Cersei kind of way. Not to mention we came this close to a Daenerys John Bone Zone. But not this time, maybe not ever. Who knows, maybe a certain Mormon could keep our favorite Mother of Dragons warm at night after all. I can't wait for the finale next week. It's gonna be a masterpiece for sure. They've been really on a roll with season seven, and I'm gonna be talking about it, as always, in detail right here. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss my finale review. I'm probably gonna split it in two. It is almost an hour and a half movie length, but I'm still looking forward to it, as I'm sure a lot of you are. And now you know what's coming at you. My name is Matt, and I'm sinking into the ocean only to be resurrected as a zombie dragon and serve the bidding of an emotionless blue man. See y'all later. Yeah.